I always enjoy that. As a matter of fact, it is a part of my responsibility to represent the administration of our great church on our campuses, both academy and college, around the world. And I told the president when he asked me to do that, as long as young people will listen to me, it'll be my pleasure, because it is a wonderful thing to be able to talk to you today. <coughs> I want to read a text of scripture in our hearing, please. It's Ephesians chapter 5 and verses 9 and 10. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. Proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. Another translation uh, terms that tenth verse this way. Find out what best pleases the Lord. The fruit of the Spirit is in all righteousness and in finding out what best pleases the Lord. Someone has said the highest achievement of human life is to find out which way God is moving and go with Him. And so, my young friends, this morning it's important for us to know that life is full of choices and making the right choices determines the extent of our righteousness and how we please the Lord. In 1937, a young chemistry student at the University of Chicago was studying out on campus and smoking a cigarette at the same time. He was so engrossed in his studies he put the cigarette down on the end of the bench and didn't take it up for quite a while. And when he did, he noticed a strange sweet taste in his mouth. Of course, being involved in chemistry and wondering about the physical reasons for such phenomena, he went to his professor and explained what had happened and asked him why he thought he got this sugary taste. If I were to give these remarks a title, it would be the taste of sugar. His professor made an assignment to him. You find out. Use your mind. And you go to the laboratory. Make this your project. Find out why you got the taste of sugar after putting a cigarette down. And so he did. And after many hours in the laboratory, this young man discovered that he had come upon a very, very important realization. He had discovered a new miracle sweetener which became quite popular in the world and was called cyclamates. Cyclamates. His findings were submitted to a conference in the United States called, uh, well, it, it had to do with the safety of food substances, and it was placed on a list called GRAS generally regarded as safe. A new sweetener generally regarded as safe. Almost immediately, the Abbott Laboratory in Chicago began to produce cyclamates, and within two years, they were found in almost every grocery store and every pharmacy in the United States. They were found in medicines and desserts and, and uh, in foods and pickles, and people were using them everywhere. And the reason cyclamates became so popular was uh, they were considered very sweet without producing extra pounds on people. And of course, women who were interested in staying slim just drank down cyclamates and ate up cyclamates on every hand. They were generally regarded as safe. Saccharin was ten times sweeter than cyclamates, but it left a bad taste in the mouth. Cyclamates left a pleasant taste. And therefore, people delighted that this new sweetener was found. And for several years, they used them without any thought that they might be harmful. Cyclamate's production became a multi-billion dollar business. But some years later, in the late 60s, two scientists at the University of Kunamoto in Japan made an exhaustive study of this new miracle sweetener, and they told the world there was reason for concern. After that, two uh, laboratory technicians over in the United States began to study, and they said also there is reason to believe that cyclamates are causing bladder cancer in rats and deformed chicken embryos, and there were many other problems, including the awful one that they were suspected of being carcinogenic or causing cancer. Immediately, the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare in the United States ordered the immediate stoppage of the production and use of cyclamates and a phased recall of all products containing them. Within a matter of months, they were taken from all the shelves of the grocery stores and the confectioners, and in a little while, they would not use them anymore in medicines and vitamins. 
Well, the question that staggered the country was, how could a thing so pleasant be dangerous? After being put on the list generally regarded as safe, what did they miss? How could they study these things exhaustively and allow people to use them for so long before also discovering that they caused cancer and other serious problems in the human anatomy? Generally regarded as safe, pleasant, and yet ultimately deadly. Sweet, but deadly. The taste of sugar, and yet deadly. Today, cyclamates are forbidden in the United States, and I should imagine in other countries as well. Sweet and deadly. My young friends, it's that way with so many things in life today, and you know that to be true. We're living in a time when the devil is using every means to fascinate and tantalize and exhilarate and thus win people away from Christ. And often the things that the devil will use appear to be regarded as safe. The taste of sugar is there, sweet but deadly. We have to give the devil credit for being that shrewd. He knows how to commingle good and evil. He knows how to tincture things with just enough of that which is evil to cause their destruction, while at the same time making it appear safe and at the same time pleasant to the taste. Sweet, but deadly. Pleasant, yet devastating. In the United States, we have several snakes that are considered poisonous that will take your life. Amongst them are the pit vipers, the rattlesnake, the copperhead, the cottonmouth. And then there is a little fella called the coral snake. When I first saw one, it's too pretty to even think of it being so deadly. And yet its venom is considered almost identical with that of the king cobra of India. That snake is the coral snake found in southern United States. He only gets to be about that long, and his little body is covered with yellow and red and black bands. It is actually so cute, you want to reach down and pick it up and play with it. And yet, it is the deadliest snake in our country. Pretty, but deadly. A man milked a rattlesnake one day and put a drop or two on a slide and under the microscope. And I was quite interested in the way he described what he saw. He said that when he looked through the microscope at this drop of rattlesnake venom, it was so beautiful it nearly took his breath away. He said it had all the glory and color of an aurora borealis, all the beauty of a fading sunset. Pretty, but deadly. Pretty, but deadly. I remember when I passed it, I had an old Ford car that was in need of repair almost all the time. There was a deacon in my church who was a mechanic, and often he worked on that old car for me. And one winter, uh, he took it in and kept it for several days, and then he called me and told me to come and get it. He had it ready. When I got to his small shop, I was surprised to see that he had the doors closed and the motor running. I walked in and chided him for this. I said, don't you know that it is deadly to be in a room where there is an automobile running, giving off carbon monoxide fumes? Oh, he said, Pastor, don't worry. I've had so much experience at this, I can always tell when we're reaching the danger level. I said, well, would you please tell me how you can tell? For I have read that carbon monoxide cannot be seen and cannot be smelled. Oh, he said, from my experience, I know that when I began to receive the pleasant taste of milk chocolate in my mouth, it's time to either shut off the engine or open the door. Pleasant, but deadly. That's the way sin is. Beautiful, but deadly. The devil knows how to fascinate us. He knows how to appeal to the flesh. He knows how to make sin pleasant. And sometimes the very thing we go at is the very thing that will destroy us. And we seem unable to realize its deadly potential. I love to read animal stories. And I read one that might offend your delicate sensibilities. But I think it's worth telling. It was a story of how the ancient Eskimo used to capture the polar bear... Uh, he depended upon this animal for food and for clothing, and it was necessary for him to know how to take it. But ladies and gentlemen, few things are more fierce than a polar bear. And so the Eskimo was no match for him, and in those days when he did not have the gun to use and other weapons that are available to him today, the polar bear came up with a very ingenious idea on how to take 
or rather the Eskimo did on how to take the polar bear. I read that he got a sharp blade that was sharp on both sides, and he would whet it until it was almost razor sharp. Then he would go out into the area where the polar bear lived, and he would bore a hole in the ice and plant the shaft of this blade in the ice, pour a little water around it, and instantly it would freeze hard. And only this two-edged blade would be sticking up above the ice. And then he would go and patiently wait behind a boulder of frozen water for the polar bear. And when this regal, beautiful, majestic beast would come up out of the sea, his attention would be attracted by the sun glinting from that sharpened meadow. His eyes were accustomed only to the blue and white of the Arctic North. And so when he saw this gleaming blade, he was curious. And he'd go over to examine it. Now, polar bear doesn't have fingers to use, so he used his tongue. And when he wrapped his tongue around the blade and drew it back, it was cut. The blade was so sharp, he hardly knew that he was in trouble. But he did have the taste of blood and being a carnivorous animal and living on flesh and blood he thought maybe this was some new thing to add to his diet and so he would keep working at it with his tongue and all the while having the sensation that blood was coming from it he just kept at it until he literally shredded his tongue and as he bled and hemorrhaged there not knowing that his life was oozing away he soon became so weak he staggered like a drunkard. It was then that the Eskimo came out with his spear and his knife to finish off this powerful and beautiful animal. He had gone at a thing out of curiosity. Beautiful, interesting, deadly. Sin, I repeat again, is like that. And righteousness is being able to discern between good and evil and to make the right choice, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord? What is pleasing to the Lord? And making a decision that regardless of how we feel about it, if it pleases God, we intend to do it. Keep in mind that most of the things the devil will send at us are pleasant to the flesh and yet deadly. The devil is smart enough not to approach most people with raw sin. For raw sin is revolting but a mixture of good and evil, that which will appeal to the flesh and at the same time destroy the soul, is the devil's most effective weapon, and he has always used that kind of weapon. When he came to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, to Eve specifically, drawing her away from her husband, he appealed with the thing that was pleasant to the eye and so forth, as the Bible declares. He made sin seem like the best thing to do. You've read the encounter in Genesis chapter 3, and in the authorized version, the devil began a sentence with, yea. Yea, hath not God said? Well, frankly, when I read that, I was curious to know why he began a sentence that way. We find two explanations for it. One is that yea was a light greeting. The devil with music in his voice said to Eve, hi there. Hello. In other words, he had to attract her attention before she would become interested enough to listen to his proposition. And one writer said that's what the yea means at the beginning of the sentence. Another said it was exactly the opposite. It was the devil's way of showing contempt for God and the rules that God had given them to live by. So he began his sentence with yea, and they interpreted it to mean, huh, hath not God said you shouldn't eat of the trees of the garden? Now the devil knew full well God had not said that. He simply wanted to engage. You know, the devil will often bring up a controversial point, a, a point of contention, some theological dichotomy. He'll bring up something to cause you to bristle and come back at him. The devil loves intrigue, and he is smarter than we are. And he loves for us to begin to rationalize and think we can match wits with him. Hath not God said you shouldn't eat? And, of course, Eve was quick to come to the defense of God. Oh, no, she said. God didn't say that. He said, of all the trees, we may freely eat except one. The tree of knowledge of good and evil. Aha, said the devil. Why, that's the one. That's the best one in all the garden. Why, God knows. And here he accuses God. God knows that if you eat of that one, certain benefits will accrue. You're going to really live. All of these other trees are for squares, but this one will expand your mind. And you'll get to the place where you know good and evil, and you will be just like God. 
same old argument he uses today when he tries to get young people, even in our church, to experiment with marijuana and other drugs. He says it will expand your mind. You will know mental and intellectual limits that you never dreamed you would know. You will have godlike powers. The devil had said in heaven, I'm going to be like God, and he failed and was put out. And now he tells our first parents, if you disobey, you'll be like God. The devil lied to himself, and now he lies to them. And he wants people to think that if you obey the Lord and you please him, you're going to miss out on something wonderful in life. Why, that one tree amongst all trees is the most exciting, the most tantalizing, the most beautiful, the most enjoyable experience you can possibly have. If you disobey God, you're going to really live. That's the way the devil approaches young people then, now, and hereafter. Young people say to me sometimes, Pastor, there's so many things forbidden, but after all, it's just life. Why can't we go to the movies? Why can't we go to shows? Why can't we read this? Why can't we watch that? It's just life. Mrs. White, commenting on this first chapter uh, in the life of humanity, says, It was God's purpose that we should never know what evil was. God didn't want people to know evil because to know it means to be encumbered with it and bothered by it. It destroys peace to know evil. Even though evil now is a part of life, it is not God's plan that we know all about it. Sometimes we think we can defend our indulgence of certain things by saying it's just life and it's wise to know what to avoid. You don't have to know what to avoid by approaching it in a negative way. If you approach it positively, doing those things which please the Lord, you will automatically avoid evil. Oh, they say, but pastor, it's just life. So is the putrefying body of a dog that's been struck along the highway. But you don't pay five dollars for a chair to sit and watch it by the hour. God does not want his people made in his image to experiment and to know all of these things. But the devil suggested to Eve, there is something sweet in disobedience. And Eve ate the forbidden fruit. And then she went and got her husband to join her in, in, in this indulgence. And suddenly the glory of God departed. And they realized they had sinned. They went to hide from the face of God. And Eve sewed together some mini scuds of fig leaves to try to cover their nakedness. But along came God in the cool of the evening. And they had to face him. If we could only remember that. We may do as we please. And nobody can walk around with us all day forcing us to do right. But always and inevitably along comes God in the moment of accountability. And that which has been sweet in the morning can be deadly in the evening. Along comes God. Not only did Eve fall into this trap, but many others, whose names are recorded in Holy Writ, fell into the same seduction of the devil. They wanted to experience that which would be pleasant to the flesh, and which at the same time, was deadly to their spiritual natures. I think of Samson. The Bible tells us that this young man was especially blessed and gifted of God. With enormous strength, both of body and of intellect, he judged Israel with great success until he took that holiday in the land of the Philistines. And down there, the devil presented him with someone who must have been really a knockout, as the young people say. There were beautiful women amongst his own people, obviously. So if he was so smitten with this one, she must have been extraordinary. You see, the devil knows what he's doing. And he knows how to appeal to the flesh. Samson returned with his heart set on doing wrong. He would not find out what pleased the Lord and do that. He said to his parents, get her for me, for she pleases me. Didn't matter whether she pleased God or the church or his parents or anyone else. She pleases me well. They tried to remonstrate with him. They tried to explain to him what God had said, that this is a forbidden relationship. It was then and it is today. But it's awfully difficult to talk to some young people until they're in trouble. How many times have I tried to counsel young folk and they would say, Oh, but if I don't get him, I'll die. And after they get him, they wish they were dead. Just like Samson. He got what he wanted, but he lost what he had. This kind of association led to Delilah. That kind of association led to his downfall. He slept on her lap one day and the Philistines came in and cut his hair. Now there he was. It had been pleasant, but now, but now, bitter. And bitter was his remorse. They took him out and made sport of him. They pushed the weak man to his feet and made him grind corn in the dusty street where the crowd mocked and scorned and jeered the strong man of Israel whom they all had feared. 
who now stood grinding cornmeal there without his eyes, his strength, his hair. And Samson's truck rock bottom. And his problem was he didn't make it a habit to try to please God. He sought to please himself. He sought to please the flesh. And when he finally fell in this matchless fight, it was not sweet anymore. Ellen White says the day will come when we will despise the thing that has come between us and God and will curse the idol that has caused our downfall. Samson had this experience. They brought him into the house of Dagon. And there the crowds gathered in a festive attitude to look at the man who represented the God of Israel. In those days, political conflicts were always contests between gods. And now here is Samson, and before him is Dagon, their God. And they were wild in their reveling. Lead me, boy, to yonder wall. Let me lean on the pillars tall. Let me rest my aching head there in the shade until I'm dead. Samson would die a pitiful suicide, saved only by the marvelous and unspeakable grace of God. But as the walls came tumbling down and he met his death crushed beneath the temple of Dagon, Samson would be quick to testify it does not pay to follow the inclination of the flesh and go against the principles of Almighty God. There are many in the Bible who did it. I think of Judas. Judas loved money and material things. He finagled to get himself elected treasurer of the College of Apostles. And he carried the bag. And he then rationalized a way to uh, pay himself for his trouble. After all, it could not be wrong. He went to the uh, trouble and the uh, burden of keeping up with all the records. And therefore, a little remuneration for his trouble could not be wrong. Rationalize it. <coughs> Mrs. White says that it was not necessary that Judas should betray the Lord. Judas made himself the betrayer by falling in love with things and with money. The devil was nursing him along as he does us. He doesn't lead you to the big fall first off every time. He nursed him along and he rationalized his conduct. And finally, the devil offered him a deal he couldn't turn down. And he had prepared himself for this, the spirit of prophecy says. Oh, how we need to learn to rely on the simple truths of God's Word and stop rationalizing. The just shall live by faith. By faith. Not by rationalizing. Not by logic alone. Not by what seems right. Not by intellectualizing or existentializing. But by faith in the Word of God. Had Judas done this, he never would have been Iscariot the betrayer. Someone else would have fulfilled that prophecy, but not he. He rationalized his activity. And then the devil caught him in his snare. Thirty pieces of silver just to kiss the Lord. You don't have to drive the nail. You don't have to put the crown of thorns on his head. Just kiss him. Now that might seem unusual for you in this culture. But I've preached for months in that culture. And it is not unusual for men to kiss men over there. As a matter of fact, I got kissed every night by scores of men on both sides of the face. I was totally unused to it, and I didn't kiss anybody back. But it's their custom. Therefore, I would not offend them by being offended by it. In that country, men kiss men. It's a gesture of friendship and goodwill. And so here was an easy thing to do. And Judas would tighten his fist around 30 pieces of silver, about $28 in our money. And it would go a long way in those days. With that money, he could have a robe that would make Peter, James, and John turn green with envy. He would have the best sandals amongst the disciples. Or he could even give some to the poor. That was always his excuse, you know. Why, he rationalized, I can do this. Christ has been set upon before. He simply disappeared. Nothing can happen to him if he is what he claims to be. He'll disappear again. I've got 30 pieces of silver and nobody's hurt for it. And so he took the money. And he led the wine-filled rabble of Israel out into the Garden of Gethsemane where the Lord prayed. And then he walked up to him and planted a hairy kiss on the face of the Savior of the world. And when he did, his job was done. How easy. He didn't have to hurt the Lord, just kiss him. Why, if Christ uh, is not thinking clearly, he will consider it a, a, a gesture of goodwill. And his fist tightened around the money. It's mine now. I can go and spend it. But when he started out of the garden, he heard the sound of a stinging smack. A Roman hand brought across the lips of the Lord. 
He looked back and he saw perhaps the blood trickling out of the corner of his mouth. And he saw Jesus submitting rather than disappearing as he had done before. Judas didn't know that Christ's hour had come. So he stood there now disturbed. That which had been so sweet in prospect is turning bitter. The money is becoming too hot to handle. He doesn't know what to do with it. As he sees the hands that created the world bound by savage men. And the Lord under much abuse is being led out of the garden. And the wine filled rabble of Israel clear their throats and bring it up. And cast it on the person of our Lord in all of its abominable stench. And Judas begins to realize he's made a mistake. What can I do with this money? Who will take it? That which had been so beautiful a moment before, he now despises. He carries it back to the priests. And when they won't receive it, every dime of it is thrown on the floor. He didn't enjoy one five cents. Every bit of it is thrown down. Now that's remarkable. He thought if he could just have this money, life would be beautiful. Opportunities would open themselves to him. But when he got it and realized what he'd done, he didn't spend a cent. Every bit of it was thrown down in contempt. And as that mob moved toward Calvary, a sudden hush fell over it. For out in the veil by the brook Kedron was the body of a man hanged by the neck and the dogs were tugging at his entrails. It was Judas Iscariot, a fit symbol, a mute symbol to generations yet unborn that it does not pay to follow the flesh. That which is sweet and go against principle. Sooner or later, we will live to regret it. It's as simple as that. It's as simple as that. essence of character is to say yes to principle and no to the flesh self-denial one of the highest evidences of Christianity in a man to take oneself in hand St. Paul said I keep my body under up here the spirit of God reigns in my mind and the rest of me will not rule my mind but my mind will rule the rest of me I will keep my body under under what under control under the discipline of the Holy Ghost, under the principles of God's Word, I will say no when the flesh cries out for indulgence. I will say no even though the thing is pleasant to the flesh. I will say yes when the flesh wants to lag behind and not do the positive things of the Word. I will keep my body under and bring it into subjection, lest while I preach to others I myself should be a castaway. This is character, and the only kind that is fit to carry into the kingdom of heaven. But we are inclined to do that which is pleasant. We are inclined to consider whether a thing is sweet or not. In closing, I would say to us all that when Jesus made a decision to die for our sins, it was not sweet in prospect. And when in the fullness of time he left those ivory palaces to come into this world of woe, it was not sweet. For he came past the palaces of kings, the homes of the rich, to be born in, amongst the poorest of the poor. Ellen White says God chose Nazareth as a place for his son to be brought up. And in those days, Nazareth had a reputation for its rascality. It was known to be one of the worst places in all of Palestine. God chose the worst place in one of the poorest homes for his son, and that wasn't sweet. He was rejected by his peers when he was growing up. You know, sometimes we think only of Christ as a babe and then a man at Calvary. But in between, Christ was a teenager. And we need to remember that. Christ attended the youth's services. There was a time when Jesus was 12 and 13 and 14 and 15 and 16. 
He went through those difficult years. There were things he couldn't do. There were gangs he couldn't join. His own brothers turned against him because he, quote, was not like them, unquote. When they had a dance at the Nazareth High School, he couldn't go. And when they had parties on Friday night, he had to stay behind. Christ went through that, the rejection of his peers, because he would not indulge in their fancy sins. It wasn't sweet. And then when he became a man, he was abused on every hand. The devil hounded his depths all the way to the grave. It wasn't sweet. It wasn't sweet when the men whom he had fed and cared for turned against him. His own received him not. It wasn't sweet when one of his disciples betrayed him and one of his disciples denied him. It wasn't sweet when he endured all of that abuse we have mentioned. And finally, they took him out and laid him prostrate on a gibbet. And they brought the hammer down and pinned him to the tree. It wasn't sweet. And when they lifted that cross into the air and dropped it into its hold and ripped his flesh, he groaned in his agony. It wasn't sweet. It wasn't sweet when the blood and sweat and spit began to sting his eyes his tongue to swell in his mouth the flies and the gnats crawled in his wounds and he couldn't even drive them away it wasn't sweet it wasn't sweet when he looked down from the cross and saw his beloved mother fainting in the dirt and profane Roman boots stepping over her he stopped dying and called John to the cross and said John look after my mother it wasn't sweet it wasn't sweet when the father hid his face the angels stopped playing their harps. And creation revolted. The sun hid its face. It wasn't sweet. When that cry shivered up from Calvary, My God, you too? Why hast thou forsaken me? And it was this that ruptured his heart. An explosion in his bosom. The sins of the world separating him from the Father. This he could not bear. And he died of a heart attack screaming in his passion and dropping his head in the hollow of his shoulder it wasn't sweet and it wasn't sweet for the church when they buried their hope in a tomb but early Sunday morning God sent an angel to roll the stone away and Jesus rose up from the dead and that's sweet and he said to his disciples as he departed I go to prepare a place for you and I will come again and receive you. And that's sweet. And he said, even though I go, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. And that's sweet. And your weakness is perfected by my strength. And that's sweet. And I am able to keep you from falling. And that's sweet. And I will come again. And I'm going to take my people home. And that's sweet. And there's going to be a grand reunion one day. And no more sorrow. And no more death. No more heartache. And no more pain. And no more sin. And that's sweet. And that prospect he offers us, and that prize must be kept before us. We must look unto Jesus and press toward that prize, and then life will be sweet, and the ultimate end of life will be sweet, and God intends that for all of his people. And may it be your experience and mine through Jesus Christ. Let us say no to the appeals made to our flesh today, that we might live with him forever and enjoy the sweetness of eternity, world without end. This is my prayer for you and for me this morning at this camp meeting. I would like to pray for those who feel, as I do, always a need of Christ's presence. From this early meeting and forward, we want him to walk with us, and he will, if we ask him to. Would you join me in that prayer? If you will, would you stand and let's bow our heads and, and ask the Lord for the strength to do right when we know what's right to do. Eternal God, our Father, we thank you for this morning hour. We thank you for the young people who decided to get out of those comfortable beds and come and bow before thee. We thank you that in their hearts they want to do your will. And we are all standing together, Lord, because we only have a will to do right. We don't have the strength. Only Christ can save us. Only thou canst make us what we ought to be. We can't even keep ourselves this one day. And we acknowledge that now and ask that you would keep us. That the Spirit of the Lord would be with us. And that we might be willing in the day of thy power 
And, O oh Lord, that we might have the courage of our convictions today, just today. Activities are planned today, and the devil will try to involve himself in all of them. As these dear young people go away for recreation, the devil will tempt, and the devil will be there to allure and to offer the things which tantalize the flesh. Give the young people the victory. May their joy today be wholesome and complete because thou art with them. Have mercy upon us, Lord. Forgive us of our sins and make us thine. And put within our hearts the wisdom and the power that the Holy Ghost brings that we might represent thee today. May these young people who are here this morning be a savor of life unto life with the other young people who did not come. May their association with your young people on this campgrounds, whom thou dost love, be elevating and edifying. May they, because they have been here, be able to make Christ popular in their midst today, that other young people might look to thee. We know that you love your young people. No, oh God, we know that they face temptations that some of us did not have to face when we were young. This is a morally mad age. Things are going on that we never had to withstand. And so our young people today need special help. And you're willing to give it because you're able to keep them and you're willing to keep them. So come and manifest thyself amongst them and in them and through them today. We beg in the name of our Savior. Amen.